We humans are creatures of habits. It's hard to get us to change our ways. But like it or not, we're going to have to adjust to greener practices. The good news is that many of the solutions out there are surprisingly simple and workable. Sustainable alternatives. That's the focus of this edition of Eco Africa. I am Chris Elims. And I am Sandra Kahumza Twinobio. Nice to have you with us. As Chris said, we'll be looking at climate friendly innovations in a number of industries. Before we get started, here is a brief look at what we have coming up. Creating quality fabric from textile rejects. Crops that feed, fertilize and produce energy. And roof tiles that light up your life. International trade has been around for centuries, but globalization has seen it go into overdrive. The upside has a lot more choice and flexible prices. The problem is shipping goods around the world takes a heavy toll on the environment. So, is it really worth it in the end? Our first report comes from Egypt, where people are looking into cutting imports of animal feed. Azolla is an invasive plant. On the surface of it, that's hardly a good thing. But besides growing extremely quickly, Azolla contains a lot of protein, which makes it ideal animal fodder. Yet it hasn't caught on as a feed crop so far. Mohammed Abdel Tawab only discovered the plant by chance on YouTube while looking for cheaper ways of feeding his household animals. If we use the Azolla to feed cattle, we can save an average of 60 to 70 percent of the feed costs. For poultry, you can save an average of 40 to 60 percent based on the bird type. Seven years ago, Mohammed Abdel Tawab began studying and then planting Azolla to feed his domestic livestock with it. And soon after, he started selling it to others. His mother, took a bit more convincing. When Mohammed first got customers, I used to laugh at them and said to myself that the world is full of weird, crazy people. <laughs> then I started trying the plant with my poultry and honestly, I found great results. Mohammed has since decided to become a full-time Azola farmer and pioneer. He grows the plants in several large tanks with a total area of 300 square meters. I started about seven years ago with a very small farm. Now we have a number of Azolla nurseries. And we've spread the idea around Egypt, helping to grow the plant on 350 acres. Most Egyptian farmers, like Abdullah Ali, feed their animals on grain and soy. But the country now imports about half of its grain and 90% of its soy. And the war in Ukraine has also further pushed up prices putting pressure on many farmers. <laughs> 300 kilos used to cost us almost nothing, but now they cost a lot. Today's price is 1,500 to 1,800 euros. But my income hasn't increased, so I don't make a profit. Azolla is much cheaper, and growing it is simple if there's water nearby. All you need then is sun and sometimes some phosphorus to act as a fertilizer. The aquatic fern was long cultivated elsewhere, for example in Peru or in rice farms in China. But the technique has largely died out. Mohammed Abdel Tawab is using modern means to spread the word in Egypt. At first, people were wary and I didn't know what to do with my harvest. Then I started using social media. I uploaded videos on my channel showing the Azolla plant and poultry eating it. That gained attention and people came to see it for themselves. I showed them the plant and the chickens. Then people started to accept the idea. <laughs> His tanks produce some 600 kilos each day, and he has plenty of customers. Experts say that the plant can also play an important role in the environment. It can purify water and provide its own nutrients. 
A type of blue-green algae grows with the azolla plant. It absorbs nitrogen from the air and transforms it into organic nitrogen that feeds the plant. It also has anthocyanins that work as antioxidants, and it's a source of vitamin A which increases the plant's nutritional value. Azola has also caught the eye of Egyptian agricultural researchers. These university graduates are producing powdered Azola feed and hope the plant can help farmers to become more independent in other ways. We want to have a social, an environmental and an economic impact. I teach farmers within fertile land and water with relatively high salinity levels how to grow the Azola plant. I'll buy their harvest from them and they'll have a decent source of income. When the test phase is over, the young scientists want to get their product approved by the Egyptian authorities. In the meantime, Mohammed Abdel Tawab has found another application for surplus azolla. It works well as an organic fertilizer. <laughs> Regardless whether it is for people or animals, a lot of time, energy and resources go into producing food. So, it's very heartbreaking to hear that according to the UN Environment Programme, around one third of all food produced is wasted. Yes, indeed, Sandra. Lack of refrigeration and poor distribution are two big reasons for that. But some foods just have a short shelf life, like bread. But at least one bakery in Germany is turning its dry bread into another valuable commodity. Take a look. Stale bread. In Germany, around 1.7 million tons of baked goods are thrown away each year. Some gets fed to animals or turned into biogas, but much ends up rotting away at the dump. For a small bakery like us, it's about 10%, but at industrial bakeries and supermarkets, roughly 30% just gets tossed. But baker Ludovic Gerbois has found a way to recycle his old bread. He does it using the bakery oven's residual heat, so he doesn't waste energy either. The roasted bread is then ground. It's now a valuable commodity. Just what Professor Thomas Bruck from Munich's Technical University needs. Hello, Thomas. I brought you fresh supplies, solid and liquid. Thanks, we'll use them for donuts. It's the season. Look what I made for you. Wonderful, I'll take it with me now. Till next time, bye. At the Technical University of Munich, biochemist Mahmoud Mazri has developed a method to extract oil from old bread. First, the ground bread is mixed with an enzyme that transforms the starch into sugar. Later, special yeast fungi will be added that feed off the sugar. The yeast cell will be small at the beginning and it's oval shape. When it starts eating more sugar, it will be more round and uh, accumulating uh, something, uh, uh, the oil inside some small bodies called lipid bodies. We have now oil. Then the next step will be to destroy that cell wall and get the oil out. People have been employing this method for close to a century, though they needed toxic solvents to access the oil. Then Mazri discovered an enzyme that cuts open the cell walls of the yeast, the enzyme derived from a mushroom. This enzyme is completely non-toxic. The goal of his research is to find an eco-friendly alternative to palm oil. It's used in almost every product. Every two products on the shelf, the one of them contain palm oil in a certain ingredient. And to find alternatives that cannot affect or result in uh, deforestation more, uh, that's the main interest of uh, the process. Palm oil is both heat resistant and inexpensive. Some 77 million tons of it are produced each year. That's what makes palm oil the top-selling vegetable oil on the world market, ahead of soya and rapeseed. But palm oil is only cheap in financial terms. The cost to people and the environment is high. Oil palms mainly grow in tropical regions. There, large swathes of rainforest are chopped down to accommodate them, 
contributing to climate change. By contrast, land is not required to produce yeast oil. All it takes is a fermentation tank, like the ones used to make beer. And it works with things other than old bread. We are completely self-sufficient when it comes to raw materials. We can use almost any food waste, including rice, cassava, sweet potatoes and corn. You can use all of the plant, not just the edible parts, even the corn stalks. The solid yeast oil tastes very mild, so it can be used in almost anything. The bakery where Ludovic Gerboin works can meet its need for fats almost entirely with day-old bread. But how could other bakeries benefit from this discovery? Several bakeries could group together to buy a fermentation tank and see how much yeast oil they can produce from their leftover bread. That way the risk isn't so great. And at some point everyone might be able to use their old bread to make french fries at home. Why not? Ludovic Gerboin uses the fresh yeast oil to make a special Easter treat. The recycled oil is used in the dough, glaze and filling of the chocolate brioche. So if you're going to succumb to temptation, at least do it sustainably. Hmm, that looks pretty tasty. Staying in Germany for now, our next report shows us another promising green alternative. But this one has to do with energy production. As we step away from fossil fuels, the future looks bright for business models like this one. There's a revolution underway on the rooftops of Germany, begun by Cornelius Powell. He's devised an all-new roofing tile system that, in addition to protecting houses, also incorporates solar modules. And they produce electricity in abundance, more than enough for the resident family, provided the sun shines. As an example, a thousand tiles on a roof mean a peak of 10 kilowatts, and depending on where you are in Germany, that's around 9 or even 10,000 kilowatt hours per year. In the long term, it pays for itself in around 20 years. His solar-paneled roof costs around 40,000 euros in total, a few thousand more than a conventional roof with added solar panels. Revolutionaries always face challenges because they're usually charting new ground. Powell's next-level tiles involve a lot of individual workmanship at the factory in eastern Germany, making production for now relatively expensive. A further hurdle is ensuring the new product is super dependable and functions flawlessly over a period of decades. The the laminated solar modules are made on the basis of conventional processes, with materials tried and tested in billions of units to date, so I'm not worried at all on that front. Cornelius Powell's company also introduced robots recently to increase capacity and lower costs. Originally an electrotechnical engineer, he got investors on board to help finance the pricey material acquisitions. Their commitment represented a big vote of confidence in his fledgling enterprise. We started out in 2011 with three people, and now we have a staff of around 70. Last year we doubled turnover to 5 million euros, and this year we hope to increase our revenue five or six-fold. Powell is confident that the energy crisis will see more German homeowners wanting to generate their own electricity. Plus, the government recently increased funding for solar roof conversions, which need to be as uncomplicated as possible. There will be two penetrations in the roof up there, where the plus and minus cables will run inside a conduit down to the inverters. It's that simple. That's what. For now, the roofing revolutionary is a relatively minor player in what is a billion-dollar market. But he's convinced that his innovative solar tiles will soon be in demand across the country. 
Germany has 15 million detached and semi-detached houses that will require energy-related modernization over the next 30 years. If you project that figure, we're talking about half a million roofs a year with two to three hundred million solar tiles to be installed. And we're looking forward to making our contribution for that target group. But with Germans known for being very price conscious, they might still need some persuading. Time is, however, on his side. If the panels produce the right results, they're bound to gain in popularity in the future. Solar tiles, what a clever and efficient way to both cover your house and your energy needs simultaneously. And one that seems tailor-made for Africa. Because if there is one thing we have in abundance, it's sunshine. You know what else Africa has an abundance of? Discarded textiles sent here from other parts of the world. And that is creating a lot of environmental problems. So much so that here in Uganda, President Yoweri Museveni declared a ban on imports of second-hand clothes. But what can be done with what's already here? Well, a startup in South Africa may have the solution. These young entrepreneurs are on a mission to defend the environment against never-ending textile waste. They snatch up off-cut fabric and of roll pieces, unsold inventory and clothing rejects and give them a second chance at life. Yeah, this is an example of some of the... Well, I'm wearing a, a recycled um, t-shirt right now. So these are the products that we actually eventually want to make. The Global South is becoming the textile dump of the Global North. Every day, almost 200 tons of textile waste are dumped in landfills in African countries. Decomposing fabrics release harmful greenhouse methane gas, while toxic chemicals and dyes sip into the groundwater and soil. But as Setu Senga and her friends have vowed to do their bit with Rewoven, inspired by their own hometown, a major manufacturing hub. We have about 300 or so clothing manufacturers operating in South Africa, about half of them on the Western Cape. So we wanted to start something to solve that problem, but at the same time create jobs, but at the same time also create an innovative solution. Their initiative makes sure fewer textiles end up in landfills by collecting clothing headed for dump sites from manufacturers and selling them to recyclers who process the material into fiber and thread for fabric production. Rewoven also uses the fiber to make footwear and different kinds of textiles. The company collects 70 tons of textile waste a month. It's just 1% of Western Cape waste. The team says finding recycling machinery in South Africa is a big challenge. Still, it plans to expand to other provinces and continue to clean up the polluting textile industry. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Using West to make something useful, that's central to some of the most exciting innovations that we have seen today. And before we say goodbye, would like to introduce you to a man right here in Uganda, who used his background in aerospace engineering to develop sustainable solutions for rural areas that are very much down to earth and the results are impressive. No more darkness in Helen Yamungu's house. It has been about a year since her home was connected to electricity. And since my children were born, they haven't seen electricity. That was the first time for them to see, but they could not believe. A village of Godgul got power at the same time. Electricity is changing lives and businesses here. Before getting electricity, my customers used to return to their homes early due to darkness. 
but with power, we can sell up to midnight. Godgur is a remote farming community located about 300 kilometers north of Uganda's capital. It borders Muchisan Falls National Park, Uganda's largest conservation area and home to endangered species like elephants. In 2009, when Ugandan aerospace engineer Peter Nyeko visited the off-grid village in the district of Nyowa, he saw a need for clean energy. First of all, it was near the national park. So if we could do something in Nyowa which would reduce the pressure on firewood, it would be interesting to help conserve the national park. Secondly, Nyowa had a lot of agriculture, which means whatever we could do with agricultural waste, we could do it in Nyowa. So in 2012, Peter Nyeko set up a private company. Today, the plant in Godgu generates 64 kilowatts of renewable energy from agricultural biomass through a process called gasification. Due to the shape of the gasifier, just a spark is enough to get the material to heat up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, it breaks down from rice husks, maize cobs, granite shells, coffee husks, into methane and hydrogen, rocket fuel. While those gases are light, they rise to the top. They're sucked out and go to power the engine. The maize harvest has just ended. After removing the kernels for food, the woman used to throw away these cobs. Now they supply them to Pitanyeko as a raw material to produce the energy they use at their homes. We take to these mandulis, we sell it to them, they buy it, we get money almost three times. We get money in this one, then we get money in the rice husks. The company also uses the waste from the gasification. During the process, Gases are separated from the solid biomass. It leaves behind tons of solid residue called biochar. There are micropores formed in the biochar. Those micropores are perfect for bacteria to flourish. When bacteria flourish in the biochar in the soil, they release nutrients into the ground, automatically fertilizing the ground. So biochar improves soil moisture, reducing the need for irrigation. Biochar helps keep the soil fertile, reducing the need for non-organic fertilizers. During the planting season, he gives the biochar out for free to about a thousand farmers in the region. Helen Yamungu also gets some. The farmers are thus benefiting from their own waste delivered to the company. So the cycle is complete and keeps on going. It's a virtuous cycle, which takes us from the vicious cycle of poverty to a virtuous cycle of prosperity. Every year, Peter Nyeko can produce up to 100 tonnes of biocar. He only uses half of it as fertiliser. The other half is used to make clean cooking fuel in the form of pellets. He also gives them out for free to families to avoid cutting down trees for firewood. So far, the company has offset over 50,000 tons of CO2 annually. I only use a few pallets to cook now compared to the big volume of firewood that I previously used. Even if I light a few pallets, cooking is faster. In the last decade, Peter Nyeko has set up five mini-grid plants in Uganda, costing some 4.5 million euros, raised mainly through venture capital. His hybrid model backs up power from biomass with solar, another clean energy source. The plant generates a total of 500 kilowatts, powering more than 100 households, businesses and institutions. In the evening, we can switch on our biomass gasifier and run it. By daytime, we have the solar running. And we have a small amount of battery capacity to balance that load. So we have uniform electricity 24 hours a day, every day of the year. On top of that, Peter Nyeko started a new project, electricity mobility among the rural communities. He has already five electric vehicles running in Godgur. In the near future, he wants to expand his clean energy model to Zambia 
Botswana and South Africa, and even further away to Spain and the United Kingdom. That's quite a project. You can't get much more circular and sustainable than that. I'm afraid we've come to the end of this special edition of Eco Africa on Sustainable Alternatives. We hope you enjoyed the program and we'll come back again next week. I'm Chris Alem signing off from Lagos, Nigeria. And it is also a goodbye from me, Sandra Kahomza, to Inovio right here in Kampala, Uganda. Don't forget, you can always check in with us on our social media channels. Or why not? Send us an email and tell us about the different projects in your area dedicated to protecting the environment. We look forward to hearing from you very soon. See you next time. Bye-bye. No, no.